Benjamin Castle are Americans. Watching the footy. Liam Ryan saying kick it my way. I want to jump over the pack and here he comes. Oh, this is Buddy Franklin. This is the greatest show Got the handball off to Myers. Myers looking for the lead of Stengel. Gee, they're good. Gee, they're sharp. Oh, who else? McDonald. Tim From inside the centre square. Boys kick the goal. Good time of day, everyone. This is Americans Watching the Footy, our third episode of Season 2, Episode 75 overall. I'm Ethan Castle, coming to you from South San Francisco, California. I am Benjamin Castle, coming to you from South San Francisco, California. And Brian Harambe, the footy cat, is also around. He's outside. He's playing with his favorite mouse toy that he just found again. Yeah, a lot's happened since we last recorded. Um, everyone except me has had COVID. Basically, you're built different. I know what you're going to say. I, I am. I mean, I was the one that was taking care of the Paris war because you were elsewhere for a lot of the time. So I understand why I got it. I'm glad we didn't pass it to you. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot of footy news to go through. So this episode is kind of just going to be a giant news dump, which I mean, it's good that we finally have enough news to do like a news dump more than once a month because there were stretches of the off season that were really slow so this should be a good dump hopefully as good as like a post dutch bros dump have you ever taken a post dutch bros dump i can't recall when it happened i've had dutch bros a couple times i i know the stories from you and others i don't think dutch bros is around in australia no it's not it's yeah it's very it's very good. local it's like Pacific, Pacific Northwest. And then they've spread elsewhere, but it's yeah. an exclusively U.S. thing. But but it's a good dump. Um, it runs through you, and you get it out. Yeah, Dust Rose is like coffee and kind of other associated drinks, often like kind of smoothie-type stuff along with coffee, like fluffier stuff, but it's good. Just goes through you, I guess. Yeah, whereas the post-Tommy's dump, I would not is know. painful. So Tommy's is an L.A.-based burger chain, mostly in L.A. There are a couple elsewhere in Southern California. There's one in, like, Vegas or something, but think in and out but everything has chili on it. It's really good, but it's I can understand why that would be painful. Yeah. So, I mean, great way to start the episode. Great. Um, If anybody has had their lunch before listening, I imagine at least a third of you have lost it now. So we got a lot of captain changes to go through. We got drug stuff, money stuff. But first off, we've got a little crossover thingy. Yeah, and the crossover is St. Kilda Heartbreak. Because, of course, a former Saint would lose the Super Bowl in just kind of gut-wrenching fashion. Aaron Sipoff did end up playing. He punted a couple times and... His last punt of the night was his worst, and it led to a big return that wasn't his fault. He ended up pushing the runner out of bounds, but by that time, Kadarius Tony had made it to the five-yard line. The Chiefs ended up taking the lead a few plays later, and it was just kind of a perfect St. Kilda way for things to happen. I feel bad for him, but I saw it coming. Did you see it coming? Did you see the Chiefs winning? I didn't know who would win. I thought it was going to be like 35-31, to 31 and the final was 38-35, so I wasn't too far off. Yeah, I'd said Eagles by five, because I expected the Eagles front seven to do more work. If you want to see kind of game planning in terms of offensive line and how to handle individual matchups in American football, what the Chiefs did at the Super Bowl is a really good place to start. Pretty remarkable that two former AFL players have punted for the Philadelphia Eagles. The other being, of course, Sav Rocca. Also, another St. Kilda connection, Nick Revolt appeared on ESPN Australia talking about the AFL and some of its crossover with other codes. I saw Mason Cox talking about that on Twitter and was able to see some of what he was talking about through that. So, cool crossover for Revolt while he's living in the U.S. At least for this year, he's back in Texas where his wife is from. On to the leadership stuff. 
you know, we already had known about a couple clubs changing captains, but all of a sudden, in the last two weeks, in fact, within the space of 11 days, a third of the clubs of the AFL had news come out about either a new captain or their old one stepping down. I mean, I guess you kind of expected it with the preseason kicking up a notch and wanting to get new leadership in place by the time practice matches started, but I would have thought we would have known about old captains standing down sooner. It's going to be interesting. We're going to have some different voices, you know, to say, are you ready, kids? And then, you know, hopefully people will be used to that voice, so they'll still say, aye, aye, captain. That was terrible, Ethan. Do better. All the captaincy chatter began on February 7th, when Nat Fife stood down as Fremantle's captain after six seasons, I thought it was going to happen maybe after this next season. He'd been battling multiple injuries for the past couple seasons in particular after having generally good health for 2019 when he won the Brownlow as well as 2020. You had the sense though, Ethan, that the official leadership around the club was going to change as a new era of the list started to take over. The timing between this and trading away Logue and letting Akers go for basically nothing, again, it's really like tempered my expectations of this coming year for Frio. Because if you would ask me the moment the 2022 season had ended, what's Frio going to be like next year? I would have said top four contender, maybe even a shot of the flag. I mean, we already knew that Lob wanted out, that Akers was trending in that direction, and that they'd have to give up a lot for Luke Jackson. So my expectations weren't maybe as high as yours were, but yeah, I thought, you know, they'd be in kind of that second tier where they're not considered a fly contender at the start of the season, but they could definitely work their way there like they did for 2022. They're now at this weird crossroads where I don't think we're really going to have an answer about if this is the right course of action to take for another couple of years. I think in time, we'll get a sense of if this was the right thing to do. But they were in a weird spot at this present moment. And not just with captain stuff. Yeah, I mean, I get Fife's decision, you know, trying to focus on his role as a forward now and starting the transition to a younger part of the list. I mean, you could see it go as young as Andrew Brayshaw becoming captain right away, but I think you're more likely to see Alex Pierce taking over. Pierce is... 27, has been involved with leadership for a while, and had stood in as captain for, I mean, much of last season while Fife was out. And it's pretty clear he is their defensive leader back there. But yeah, overall, weird spot. You know, you see a lot of clubs transitioning between eras. You see Richmond doing it pretty smoothly. I think Geelong, that's what they're going for. Yeah, I mean, Richmond, Geelong has done it clearly as well as anybody. But I'm not sure if Frio are going to be quite they're alongside those clubs because they've gotten much younger as quickly as they have. I mean, I want to see a full year out of Jai Amos, and we've got so much more to look forward to with guys like your favorite on the list, Nathan O'Driscoll, Heath Chapman working things in the back. So they've got positive trending pieces, of course. But are we looking at really 2024 contention for them now? It's that they're making this shift, like, in the immediate aftermath of one solid season instead of after, you know, multiple years and a real flag run. That's what makes this all so strange is, and also not much of it was their choice aside from Jackson. If they were coming off of like multiple deep finals runs, flag or not, I would say sure. But last year was their first finals appearance since 2015, which just, it's like you got all this way to do that. I've won, but at what cost? It's just like, what were they building towards last year? Because last year, it seemed like, yes, there were some older pieces involved, and you knew Lob was on his way out, but it's like, you built all this, you've made these great strides forward, and now you're kind of willingly taking a step back. And if they win a flag in a couple years, it'll be worth it. You know, are they looking at things and kind of realizing, hey, we can load up and really go for it? Or it's like, what's the... What's the rationale for where they are right now? I'd love to pick their list boss or their president's brain about everything right now. There's a good chance they're just seeing things that I'm not. They're probably smarter than me, but just the timing of everything. And it's 
you know, I was so high on them last year, and now it's like, all right, they look like a team that should be somewhere around seventh on the ladder, but they don't blow me away. And there are a whole lot of teams that could end up around there. So, yeah, all of a sudden, it's like, where are they? They're a team that I think could be vulnerable if the power rebound or if the Suns take that next step, which I would not have said that a few months ago. Or if Carlton can actually win one of their final few games. And Fife giving up the captaincy has very little to do with that. It's just more like a sign of the times thing. Yeah. It was also a sign of the times that Rory Sloan would pass on the captaincy. He'd been a co-captain in 2019 and a sole captain for the next three years. He's going to be 33 by the Crows' first game and tore his ACL early last year, so he could fully focus on his own form. That's a common thread between these captains that are stepping down. They're on the older side now toward the end of their careers. But I did not expect the Crows to go the direction they did with Sloan's successor, Jordan Dawson. 22 games and one after the siren winner into his Crows career. I mean, I like that this should presumably be a captain who's going to stay in the role for a long time. He's only 25. And of course, he came home. That's why he wanted to be a Crow in the first place is to come home to South Australia. He's the Crows' first South Australian native captain since Simon Goodwin, who was captain upon his retirement in 2010. So it's been a minute. I like that there hasn't been a whole, like, oh, no, we don't have a captain who's from here. Because, like, if the Montreal Canadiens captain doesn't speak French, the whole fan base shits themselves. Happened with Saku Koivu. Dawson was added to the leadership group partway through the season, but, again, having somebody come in so quickly and then being named captain, it just seems really sudden. And I want to know whose decision it was to name him captain. You know, a lot of clubs have players vote on it, but that isn't always the case, so... Was it Matthew Nick's call? Did upper leadership of the club have a say? Really, who made the decision here? And also, I wonder if Tom Dude feels slighted by this at all, because he'd stood in his captain a few times and had been on leadership for a while. Dude's form has not been something that I would think of as becoming of a captain, so maybe that's part of it as well, but clearly the Crows have a path in mind, and as we said in our premiere with our wish list, I think the Crows see themselves contending by 2024. And if they can figure out fullback, they can definitely get there. Dawson's more of a halfback and a midfield connector, so it's the people behind him that I'm more worried about. The Brisbane Lions have announced that Dane Zorko stepped down as captain after four and a half seasons. Yeah, I didn't realize that he had taken over partway through the 2018 season. Incidentally, from another Dane. Same spelling, too, which is even weirder. I'm now ready to go all in on the Lions 2023 premiers. I might just reinvest the $6.80 that I made today betting on the She Believes Cup. I believe you said it was the Brazil versus Canada match? Yep, I bet on Canada and they won 2 to 0. I bet $2 and won $6.80. Airhorn. You know, the Lions have a stacked team. They add into it with guys like Josh Dudley. Obviously, the whole Marcus Adams thing doesn't help, but while they may be a little thin defensively, they're so loaded elsewhere, and now they've gotten over pretty much everything that I thought would hold them back. Couldn't win with a G, couldn't win a final on the road. They did both of those things last year, and I thought Zorko is not a good captain. I thought he's kind of immature for it, and now that's a non-issue. How much did you think that before... The whole incident with Harrison Petty round 23, because I'd already been trending that way. Yeah, that kind of put it in focus, but it had been it had been visible before. Again, I think he's like a great guy to have on your side. Good vice captain type dude, but he is not captain material. Captains are supposed to be level headed and stable, and that is not him. Somebody who ties into discussion for potential successor as captain and also for solving problems in the back. You know, Harris Andrews, I'd highlighted as having a below expectation season last year, but he's been on leadership for a while. He's been vice captain for the past five years. He's probably the front runner to become captain now. Seems like Hugh McCluggage and maybe Lockie Neal are being floated as candidates as well. Andrews does really need to be that leader on the field, especially in the back third. Without Adams, he doesn't have someone as skillful as, and some of the other pieces around him to support him. So. He's going to be in focus regardless. 
As for who else fills out that spot, Jack Payne took Adam's spot during finals. Darcy Gardner was up and down last year. I remember pinpointing him a couple times as being responsible for a couple goals that turned games against Brisbane's favor. But the sum of the parts back there, I think, should be able to keep them afloat, if not more, especially when they should have enough scoring ahead of them. If you're a big believer in defense wins championships and you look at Melbourne's own defense in 2021, the great ball of Geelong last year, I see why you'd be a little hesitant, but I just think this team is so good elsewhere that it'll compensate. And my prediction right now would be Lions over Swans in the grand final. You know, it's funny, Ethan, that you're talking about captains needing to be level-headed, probably having clean records because Toby Green is not that. He falls much more into the Dane Zorgo camp. But on the 15th, it was announced that Toby is Greater Western Sydney's standalone captain. He'd been co-captain last year along with Stephen Canelio and his eyebrows and Josh Kelly. Those two are now vice captains. I mean, I always had the feeling that if they were to name a standalone captain, it would have been Toby. I'm just surprised that they did. Despite everything I just said, I actually love this move. Because of where the Giants are as a team, they can do something like this and give zero fucks. Like, you look at the range of possible outcomes. He's a great captain. He's a pain in the ass and makes them more watchable because last year they were super boring and hardly ever played in any tight games and sucked. I mean, as you know, as they say in the Lexavan commercial, What's the worst that can happen? You know, the worst that could happen is, like, someone feels alienated and people end up leaving. I mean, Toby's already 29, which is kind of old in footy terms, and Adam Kingsley probably is going to want to usher in his own guard and... In a couple of years, Jason Gilby will be the captain and everyone will have five gallons of milk a day anyway. So I really think this is a thing where if this was a team with any sort of real aspirations at all this year, I would be screaming like, no, what the fuck are you doing? But because it's GWS, who's probably going to be really bad and was just boring and not worth thinking about for more than 10 seconds last year. This instantly makes them more compelling and more watchable. So I am all for. So all it took for people to actually pay attention to GWS was Toby Green and a few cartons of milk. It's more than a few cartons of milk. Yeah, fair. Like a probably a semi truck full. But point stands. Again, there are things that bad teams can do that good teams cannot. Like to use the NFL example. Dan Campbell, the Detroit Lions coach, is a great coach for a bad team. I mean, it's self-explanatory because they're the Detroit Lions. I mean, there might be people listening who don't know shit about the NFL, but... Yes, but for those of you who don't watch the NFL, the Detroit Lions have that sort of reputation. Yeah, they're, they're basically always shitty. But my point being, if you're a bad team, you don't need a coach who's a great game manager. You just need a coach who we'll get the guys to run through a brick wall for him. And similarly here, you're playing by different standards than if you were a serious flag contender anytime in the next couple of years. And there's an off chance that everything works and he ends up being a great captain. I think more likely it's somewhere in the middle and it's just, again, it just makes them more compelling. I mean, how much of this do you think, how much of this, is it tied in at all? Is there a vote of confidence from Adam Kingsley and the club brass that Toby can maybe kind of reel things in and not need the sort of tribunal discipline that he's needed in the past? Do you think that's tied in? I don't know. I think it's just to instill some fire in them more than anything. And not like Toby needs any. No, but there are other guys that probably do. Now, I want to keep a running count of suspensions and tribunal visits for him versus Braden Proust because if you think about it, Toby's probably not even the most reckless player on his team, which is kind of insane. It's honestly scary. And we harped on Proust so much last year, I'm not sure if we actually mentioned him when we went over the Giants in our wish list for these first couple episodes this year. But Proust held back the Giants so much last year with his poor discipline because he has the raw talents to be you know, a top-tier or maybe second-tier Ruck in the AFL. 
The problem is he's never on the deck for long enough. Yeah, I guess our wish list item for him would just be stop being an absolute fucking goon. Also, Braided Bruce takes the cake for most reckless Braided, regardless of spelling. And the first couple years we watched the sport, we would find that shocking because of Braden Maynard, who you coincidentally kind of wanted as Collingwood captain, despite Collingwood being a contender. What's up with that? I just thought because it's Collingwood, it would have fit them well, it would, like, like a club identity thing. Yeah, it would have fit the brand. It would have fit the identity, the culture. Sometimes the captain just needs to be a representation of the team. Sometimes it needs to be a guy that kind of stands out and doesn't fit the mold of the rest of the team. But sometimes it totally works for the captain to just be like an extension of the rest of the team. And he would have been awesome for that. In fact, like most of Collingwood's guys don't have that edge right now. Don't think Darcy Moore does. So, again, I'm all for this. Don't get me wrong. I think Darcy Moore was a good pick and, a you know, a very kind of the, the obvious pick. But it's like not an entertaining pick, not as entertaining as Maynard would have been. It's like you're Collingwood. You got to do something to make people hate you. Is having the name Collingwood not enough these days? I mean, I'm sure it's different when you're surrounded by Collingwood fans. But from halfway around the world, you know, it's it's hard to feel that through a computer screen. I mean, also, we've got a soft spot for Collingwood because of Mason, obviously. Finally, two Victorian clubs announced some captaincy changes on February 17th. Firstly, Dyson Heppel stepped down as Essendon's captain. After six seasons, he became captain at a really important time for them, you know, dealing with the aftermath of the drug scandal after all its suspensions had been served. And I don't think I ever really got a whole lot of respect in his role because of how the club struggled during his captaincy. And as for his playing impact, we definitely noticed a decline in his form in the first part of last season. And now he may not even be in Essendon's best 23. So from that point alone, I can understand why he stepped aside. Do you know what I think is the biggest issue, though, and why he struggled, Ethan? Coaching? Even more than that, he cut his dreads. You didn't even know that he had dreads for a while. No, I did not. Yeah, I mean, studies show that dreads improve a player's performance. It's It becomes like a Samson thing almost. It's especially apparent in the NFL. Which player was it that caused you to realize that? Was it... Might have been Torrey Smith. Beloved Ravens receiver. And Eagles. I think he won a Super Bowl with both. Believe so. But when you go away from the dreads, you've got to still leave enough of them. You know, you can't go straight from the dreads to the flat top. You see what Grind Myers did? It worked out for him. You just can't cut him right away. So from that alone, I can understand why Heppel struggled. I mean, obviously the coaching doesn't help. And the midfield couldn't defend. Really nobody could defend on Essendon. And Zach Merritt chalked it up to coaching with what he's been remarking lately. He seems to very much be a Brad Scott yes man. So it makes sense between that and his on-field leadership already as to why he's exceeding Heppel. I would consider just going in a new direction with their weird situation as a club overall, but I think Merritt is like the safe bet. Mason Redmond would be the one other that I would think of as making sense, but again, he can't defend, and I think his priority this season should be on defending because he can do the other things. Same thing with Nick Hind, and really that entire back third that they didn't help at all. I mean, they traded away some tall depth in Aaron Francis, too. The other piece of captaincy news from the 17th, I mean, I guess it kind of follows along with what you said about GWS, where a team that isn't contending can have kind of a, a rougher captain to inspire them. I mean, I don't think James Sisley has the disciplinary record of Toby Green or anyone like him, but point kind of stands. I say this in the Australian way which is a very affectionate way. He's got a little cunt in him. I'm just so not used to that word being used in that sense. In America, you don't say that word. In Australia, they throw the word around like it's, like it's just, what word would we use? I don't know, it's just a word. Yeah. Still haven't gotten used to it after three plus years. I didn't expect it to be Luke Bruce, who's a vice captain, and really there weren't any other standout candidates following Ben McAvoy's retirement. Sicily's definitely shown a willingness to stand up for himself, get in other guys' way. Stand up for other guys, just 
kind of be a shit heel in general. I remember him and Aaron Naughton having some fun battles last year in particular. I remember it involving headbands. This is the type of guy that needs to be a captain at a place like Collingwood, but also, like, I need more reasons to hate Hawthorne, so this might help with that. I didn't realize Sicily's 28. Maybe it's just that, you know, athletes start and retire younger in Australia than they do in the U.S., at least professionally, because we have the college ranks over here. But by the time Sicily is ready to pass on the captaincy, Sam Mitchell's team will have really taken shape. And yeah, I really think that these guys, as I've said, are setting themselves up nicely for long-term success. And honestly, this doesn't do much to move the needle one way or the other. In a few years' time, Dylan Moore will be more of a candidate, more freshly extended through 2026. The Hawks locked up him and Ned Reeves through then. And Reeves is someone who we both believe will be a really important piece for Hawthorne in the coming years between what he does as a ruck and in some of the center half forward work he did last year as well. A bit tall for that, but I like what we saw from him there. Mitchell started experimenting with that in the later rounds last year. Knowing how footy players age, whose career will last longer? Dylan Moore for Hawthorne or Dylan Moore who was just extended by the Seattle Mariners? That Dylan Moore is 30. He was just extended through 2025. Footy Dylan Moore is only 23. So I'm going to lean with Footy Dylan Moore, as will I, but the positional versatility that baseball player Dylan Moore offers should not be disregarded. Other contract extensions worth mentioning, Tyson Stengel through 2026 and Stephen May for 2025. The Stengel extension just further validates the amount of good that Eddie bets by basically being Stengel's roommate for a year. Being his uncle, basically, <laughs> for one year. Hopefully that's all it took, because Eddie's not working with the club anymore. He's going to be doing more with his foundation. I still need to read his book, by the way. I need to make sure I get a get a hands on the, the boy from Boomerang Crescent. He's just a fascinating figure to me between what he was in the first couple of years that we watched the game and kind of the life that he's taken on since retiring. But yeah, I mean, Stengel showed everything he needed to on the Oval last year. 53 goals a premiership medal, an all-Australian jacket. And at 24, he's likely just about to hit his prime. Although he could be, like, younger than most guys his age in terms of wear and tear because of the time he spent not playing. I mean, he still played in 2021, just not AFL level. It's still, there's a different level of physicality and wear and tear that comes with that, so don't rule it out, of course. As for Stephen May, I mean, we saw what, Melbourne became when he was off the oval. Their defensive structure is too rigid. It's to the point of being brittle, really. And it got exposed last year, both with and without him, because at some point, someone was going to crack that code. That was, you know, no disrespect to what Simon Goodwin had done and constructed with his staff, because it was quite good and kind of groundbreaking. But it's like, at some point, someone was going to figure out, it's like, just look at how basketball teams beat zone defenses and apply those principles. And... Eventually, I think that's what ended up happening. I mean, Melbourne's forward strategy was nothing too creative either, and that was cracked by round 11 last year, if not sooner. So you factor both those things in, and Goodwin and company are going to need to do some innovating again. I think he and Mark Williams and Adam Uze are capable of that. It's a matter of whether they do, and hopefully some fresher faces will get them on track to do that. I'm looking forward to seeing Jacob Van Ruyen in Melbourne's 22 Hopefully, in round one, having a fresh, tall face in their keyboard is going to do wonders. Again, what I really want to see out of them this year is not, you know, the Weeda Brown stuff, where it's just like, all right, here's one crappy piece that didn't work, so let's try the other. I mean, right now, I see Ben Brown as maybe being outside the best 23. If Van Rien slots in, particularly so. I mean, you also have Brody Grundy coming in, which adds to the tall mix. and also. With Melbourne having the tall spoils that they do, are they going to try and force Grundy or Gaunt into sort of a Mark Blitzoff's thing where they have him be more on ball, more center half back? Because, you know, I can see them trying it, and I can see a lot of teams trying to force their rucks into sort of a Blitzoff's role, and I can see it backfiring. You know, we've talked about this before. There needs to be a medium struck between 
the strategy the coach wants to implement, and the strategy that fits the players on the list. And it should lean more toward what the list is ready for. That said, if there's any guy who could take on that role, it would be Max Gone. I mean, Grundy's shown versatility as well, but with his recent injury history, that's a bit hampered. So I could see Goodwin trying it with both of them. Just look at the role that Gone played during that finals run in 2021, where it looked like there were you know, three of them on the field at a time, and it's like, why not try to create that as much as possible? Especially if they have a couple other talls out there. I mean, Gone was able to do some of the work that he did further back in the 2021 finals because of Luke Jackson's emergence. Hey, if you're listening to this, you're probably a man aged 18 to 35, so obviously you want to make a podcast. A podcast? Well, that's a dumb idea, but sure, why not? How do I start? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast from your phone or your computer. No fancy software needed. It's so easy you get edited while drunk. Anchor allows you to distribute your podcast on platforms like Apple, Spotify, and more, just like we do. Best of all, it's completely free. Not only is it free, you can even make money from listener support or ad revenue. Download the Anchor app. That's A-N-C-H-O-R, like on a boat, or on the Fremantle logo, or go to anchor.fm to get started. Plus, it's a .fm domain, so you're also helping out the good people of the Federated States of Micronesia. Don't forget, you can follow us both on Twitter and on YouTube at Americans Footy. We'll be more active on YouTube in the coming months as we start putting out some more videos there, talk maybe some shorts about how we got into the game and other interesting points, especially from the American fan perspective. You can find both of us personally on Twitter. I am at BenjaminHK01. I am at Castle Media. That's Castle with a K. Brian Harambe is on Instagram at Cat Named Brian. He snores. It's pretty adorable. You know, it's not like hog me, 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 me adorable, but I think it might be even more precious. Everything he does is amazing. It's like this tiny little person. His voice is so incredibly high pitched for his size, too, because he's not a small cat. You know, he's not overweight, but he's not small by any means. Pretty average size. Now that February 15th has passed and, you know, by a few days now, Close to a week by the time you will hear this. All the lists have been finalized, and so a couple teams made signings in the supplementary period that between last episode and now. A couple rucks were signed. Carlton signed Hudson O'Keefe, who had been passed on the draft but was highly regarded from Vic Metro. He was a name that I'd heard in draft discussions, and even with Zach Williams' injury, I can understand why Carlton went that direction. Are you kind of thinking along the same track as me with that, Ethan? Because the way that I saw it, Tom DeConing can fit in a couple different spots, so he can't be tied down there, and Mark Pittenet has not shown himself to be able to stay on the field for a full season. I think DeConing best in that defensive role. I mean, kind of runs in the family. His full field marquee abilities were on display for a lot of last season. Certainly capable as a ruck, but again better served elsewhere. And you can see the difference from when Pitnet was healthy versus when he wasn't with how all the pieces had to be shuffled, starting with DeConing. I don't know nearly as much about Richmond's signee, Kalen Bratke, other than he has a total ice hockey name, honestly. You look at the spelling of that, and also just anything ending with, with an N just screams hockey. I mean, there's so many Cadens and Jadens making their way through juniors in the NHL now, and just a very white name like that. Seriously, a guy with this name, I mean, I'm surprised he hasn't showed up on the Winnipeg Jets roster. Guess that means Quinn Narkel is kind of out of a spot there. He'll end up somewhere eventually, right? Somewhere eventually, the VFL at the very least, and maybe he'll make his way up from there, but he just needs more defensive capability and just ability other than being a straight-up runner because he's got great stamina and can run for days, but really, where else is he going to fit in there? And Richmond already has plenty of people who can run. He's also just a non-defender. Exactly. Meanwhile, you know, Richmond definitely does have some depth to address because after Tom Lynch and Noah Balta, who can play multiple roles, but after Lynch especially, you know, there's a significant drop-off there. So if Radke can work his way into 
a more relevant key spot supplementing Lynch that will definitely be worthwhile. Collingwood probably had the most interesting supplemental period. It looked like they were done after signing a Ruckman in Oscar Steen from West Adelaide. Perhaps they think Steen's going to be ready before someone like Aiden Begg, who we saw a few times last year, but I didn't think had the height for it and just looked to be overshadowed and, and really maybe a little overwhelmed by everything. So yeah, we thought Collingwood were done after that, and it looked like Oleg Markov, who had been training there, was trending toward being on Carlton's list, especially after Zach Williams had his injury. Um, All of a sudden, no. After a single day of training at Carlton, Markov joins the Pies. He's the Grandpa Simpson gif. His time at Carlton, definitely. So it turns out that Charlie Dean was placed on the inactive list. Just rotten luck for him not being able to get an AFL game still, but that opened the spot for Markov. They liked him enough to have him train there all offseason. I figured he'd have some sort of landing spot. When he was delisted, you looked at the delistings, and you had to figure Markov was in that upper tier of guys who were going to get another shot. As inconsistent as he had been, and despite his health issues, there's enough upside there that it's worth entertaining. And on a club with the depth that Collingwood has in most spots already, I can understand why they're supplementing halfback. But the much more interesting Collingwood story involved a player who's been under a magnifying glass for the better part of a year, and it's for less savory reasons. It's also known as Jack Ginevan being a 20-year-old. Yeah, he was caught doing, I guess, ketamine on video. It sounded like cocaine at first, but I guess it's ketamine, which, I mean, he should be careful. Mr. Krabs overdosed on it, and that's how he died. My first question is, especially when you're as public a figure as Jack Ginevan is, why would you do that anywhere than, you know, completely in private? And Because you know that there are going to be cameras on you anywhere, apparently including in a toilet stall, which is a whole other topic. Yeah, that's kind of fucked. But also, I'm just glad that he didn't have recorded himself, which makes him significantly less stupid. Less stupid than Bailey Smith, for example? Yes. Or the former Miami Dolphins, now San Francisco 49ers staff member. That was just a weird video. And we actually have a video of that. We only have the screen caps from Baz. Yeah, anyway... Honestly, what's more fucked with this is the whole media dealing around Seven Network and Collingwood with this. So Seven got the scoop, and they alerted Collingwood saying, hey, we got this. And they didn't report it until they were able to get Ginevan, it's like, basically get an interview with Ginevan about it. And that kind of let Collingwood take the lead on it. It's just interesting learning about all the media dealings involved with this sort of news breaking. And it's we don't really get this sort of behind-the-scenes stuff in the U.S. about it. At least, it, we don't ever really learn about it, but there was a there was an article that I saw on Code that kind of got me into the deeper story with this. I can say from experience that sometimes you do these things, you know, with who breaks the story and how to maintain relationships, where a lot of times what I've done, at least, is... You know, if I get something first or get something from a source, I go to confirm it and then check in on, you know, when does this become official? When can I break this? And that's how you get to be the one who has it first and how you maintain your relationship for future stories. So maybe that's what was going on here. We just kind of, it's just more behind the scenes that I'm used to going. Whereas you being, you know, fully in sports media as an editor would know more of that, obviously. Ginevan suspension, two games just like Bailey Smith. Remember, Smith missed four games because he also had that headbutting suspension at the same time. The controlled substance policy from the AFL just feels so lax compared to American leagues, though, where it's taboo to the point of, like, sometimes full-year suspensions or blackballing. Now, it, I don't think it should be that far, and maybe the idea is that the legal system will take care of itself, but I think the bottom line is the league's much more concerned with performance-enhancing substances rather than other things that don't really help you on the field. And I'm fine with that because it's like, you know, people get all up in arms. Oh, why does the NFL suspend this guy for this more than this guy for that? Well, a lot of times it's like there are things that are just within football versus things that, you know, are crimes that can be punished elsewhere. 
Are we thinking like Calvin Ridley being suspended for a year for betting as opposed to people getting a fraction of the time when there are domestic violence incidents that result in, you know, criminal charges and sometimes convictions? Pretty much exactly that, yeah. Thankfully, this doesn't go as far when there have been domestic issues in the AFL. There's just been standings down. I mean, I can only think of of one at the AFL level during the time that we've been following the sport, and that was kind of three stories wrapped in one. Now, if that story were a Western Australian team, the biggest deal would have been breaking quarantine. So with Ginevan being suspended two games, obviously he's not going to be in the mix for round one against Geelong, which I know you're happy that the Cats aren't going to have to deal with him. That does mean, though, that Bobby Hill could definitely step up and take that spot, at least for the moment. So, you know, if he's ready to go after battling cancer last year, looking forward to seeing him on the field. Collingwood will have more than enough capable players either way. Yeah. But this kind of leads us to talking about other players who will be or are at risk for missing round one. There's no shortage of that. We'd known about Sam Walsh's disc issue since August, and somehow they decided, yeah, let's wait on surgery until the point where he's going to miss now the first month of the season. Despite making progress in training, that's still the plan. I think the biggest beneficiary of that is probably going to be Adam Chera. Not Woof. Because we already know that George Hewitt's going to get the time on ball, and he obviously missed that last year when he was injured. But Chair is better served as an inside player, and I don't know why so many people shoehorn him into this wing role that he doesn't really belong in. You know, Blake Akers is going to take care of that now as well, so I think Chera's possession numbers especially are going to be higher these first few rounds. And I think we're really going to be able to see more of what he's capable of. Like we saw in the final few games of last year, especially round 23. Toby Bedford finally into a stable role, and he injured a tendon in his hamstring, and he's going to be out 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah, this one broke while we were recording, and, you know, I'd been hyping up Bedford a lot. He showed well when he was selected in the main 22 last year. I believe it was eight goals in the five games where he was selected in the main side, but so often in list purgatory where he was really their super sub. Hopefully his recovery is fast and he can get to that spot where he really showed the ability that Melbourne never fully unlocked. I mean, it was also tough for him playing behind somebody like Kazi Pickett. So when Bedford gets on the field, I think the D's are going to start seeing what they missed. I also know that Brent Daniels could be ready for round one. He also has a hamstring injury, though it's far less serious. Haven't seen much out of Daniels, especially last year. So hopefully we'll just learn a lot more about what he and what a lot of this Giants list is made of because, again, they may have been kind of the least remarkable team to watch last year. You know what? At least with the other teams that were getting blown out, there was some entertainment involved in it. Like, you know, maybe as an Eagles fan, I was more invested in that, and that's why I'm saying that. Well, some of those Eagles games, you know, it was like the stop, he's already dead type deal. Well, GWS didn't usually get to that level. It was just like just enough that you don't change the channel by halftime, but not enough that you're on the edge of your seat. It just kind of became background noise. Someday, parents will explain to their kids that they're there because they got really bored watching the GWS Giants, so they bong. We'll go with that. On to a team with ongoing depth issues. We've been bemoaning St. Kilda's key forward injuries throughout this offseason. Max King is going to miss significant time. Jack, 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 Jack. Hayes is missing the start of the season with a broken metatarsal. Now Tim Membry has had minor knee surgery. He's expected to be fit for round one, though he might not be at 100% for that. So it just becomes even more dire because Membry was probably the biggest difference maker kind of on a game-by-game basis for them last year, I'd say. They were bad to begin with. This really doesn't affect much, even if he was out long-term. It's not going to change my perception of them. Maybe they win five games instead of six with their injuries. The weird thing to me is that, you know, they were talking about Dougal Howard as an option to move up from fullback, when it's like, your defense sucks to begin with, and he's one of the better members of it. 
I mean, I have heard more conversation around Zane Cordy being moved up before this. Are they saying Howard in addition to Cordy, or is, is it this dire that it's really all tall hands on deck? I was thinking this is kind of like one of those, you know, would you rather lose 120 to 60 or 140 to 70? You know, it counts the same way percentage-wise, but... I don't really think the Saints are going to be concerned about percentage when it comes to the end of the season, unless it means that they get a slightly different draft pick in what's expected to be a pretty deep draft class. I'm still thinking about, this is a new term that I'm going to have to get patented or trademarked or something, baby-making footy, where it's like, Footy that isn't shitty enough that you just turn it off and go to sleep, but also not good enough that you're actually compelled. So you have it on in the background and you bump uglies. I thought that you'd just be in a closet and the baby would end up looking at Ralph Wiggum. Mrs. Krabappel and Principal Skinner were in the closet making babies and I saw one of the babies and the baby looked at me. On the Bulldogs front, Cody Waitman has an adductor injury. We don't know how... Bad it is, and there's been no talk about him missing round one, so hopefully that's one of those things where it's not, you know, oh yeah, it'll be back to training in a day, and then, you know, two weeks later, oh yeah, he'll be back to training in a day, and it just keeps on going down the road. Hopefully this is one of those, because I'd like to see a full season out of him and see if he can create some stability, because, you know, he was one of those guys, it's like six goals or zero, with, like, no just okay performances he was either great or invisible six goals no goals or an elbow popped out of its socket he continued playing in that game i just remembered that super high scoring affair with the giants see that was not baby making funny that was actually compelling funny yeah rare for gws yeah that was 125 to 105 back in june definitely not baby making funny waitman will probably be in the running for some more midfield time with his skill set and also, you know, with Dunkley being out of the picture. So where exactly he slots in will be interesting to watch. They've also got, you know, the plethora of talls that they have that could make him a little redundant there. You already have Josh Bruce being moved back, which is puzzling enough to me. I mean, I guess you'd rather have Aaron Naughton and Sam Darcy forward than Bruce at this point. I don't know, it's also funny because, you know, a guy coming off an ACL injury, you probably want him moving less, and being a full forward would entail moving less. I'm just shrugging. I'm just saying it. Also, Adam Trelore hurt his ankle more than three weeks ago now. I believe we discussed it before. His chances of playing in round one are increasing. Trelore was really, really visible last year, I'll say. You know, whether he was good or bad, he was a player with... A lot of focus, I think especially with Bonapelli sliding up, Trelore had a lot more on-ball time along with Jack McRae. And I think Trelore's just in general a more noticeable player between him and McRae. So the spotlight will be on him again for sure. Is it also the just kind of being a former Collingwood player and the attention that goes with that? I don't know. I think that would have dissipated by now. I think it's more that he's just really good and really important to their success. I mean, you you can say that about McRae just as much. You know, what is it about Trelore that makes the difference, though, between him and, and McRae? Maybe just kind of... I think the recency of him moving, not so much the Collingwood factor, the gist that it, you know, this is only his third season there, whereas McRae's kind of been there. Yeah. And, you know, his style of play isn't flashy, but it's definitely more noticeable, I'd say, than, you know, a very consistent passer like McRae. Now, it's taken this long for us to mention it, and it's taken this long for it to happen. Some injury concerns are present at Mineral Resources Park for the West Coast Eagles. Not as severe as last year, but it may involve a delayed start to the season for one Jack Darling once again. Although this time, it wouldn't be because of his own choice. Or do we chalk that up to a brain injury? This time, it's a left angle issue. Surgery is not required. There were fears of... Our favorite injury word, also our least favorite injury word, syndesmosis. We haven't really heard of that at all before we started watching the footy, huh? No, like, I don't think we had ever. Which is strange because it's a pretty common sports injury. I guess we just we never heard American sports go into that sort of specificity with ankle injuries. But that's not the case for Darling. He doesn't have that and he may be available round one. But the Eagles also win the award for weirdest injury of 2023 thus far. 
How about a ruptured spleen? I mean, it happens. Just not something you hear of. I mean, who in the world thinks about the spleen when it comes to sports injuries? I think I've heard of it happening once or twice, but can't think of any specific instance in which that happened. Yeah, happened to Jack Williams, a young key forward who had been training well, may not have been in the best 23 right away, but would have been pushing for selection for sure, putting some pressure on some of the key stock, at least at the waffle level. But yeah, this is the first time you've heard of Jack Williams. He ruptured a sleeve on, quote, an innocuous tackle. Happens. Now, it's fitting that since we've been talking about a Western Australian team that the next name in our notes is Mark McGowan. This one being the reporter. Yeah, that's the catch there. You know, this isn't a Mark McGowan who's like got a lock down the state button like President Trump had a Diet Coke button. That was real, by the way. I wish the button itself was bigger, like, you know, the easy button from Staples. But yeah, like I remember when President Biden had his first photo from the Oval Office. The first thing that people noticed is he took out the Diet Coke button. I'm looking this up right now, and apparently the button was also used to prank new visitors to the White House sometimes and would be used to request lunch. Ah, okay. People would think it's like the nuclear button and would freak out when he pressed it. That, that's pretty awesome. Mark McGowan probably has, like, a red lockdown button on his desk, though. Mark McGowan with a K. Ooh, apparently the button did return a few weeks later to Biden's desk, but nobody knows what its purpose is now. Because different presidents have had the button, like, Obama used it to order tea. Fifth. Just, again, it needs to be, like, a comically oversized button, not just, like, a little tiny thing that's, like, the size of a button to, like, turn on a video game console. Yeah, but... This story comes to us from Mark with a C McGowan, the footy and tennis reporter primarily, for The Age. So I was reading this story from him from a few weeks ago about the injury allowance and how that's declining and all sorts of other matters about AFL finances and just everything about it that I read aggravates me because we know so little about it. You look at U.S. sports and there are websites dedicated to breaking down salary situations for teams. I remember following this stuff for the NHL specifically. You see it every year around the trade deadline where you can see details on every player's contract, what their cap hit is, what they're actually making every year. We're learning about AFL news from just this article that says, oh yeah, there was this $400,000 allowance that was outside the salary cap for signing and paying injured players and now it's gone down this year firstly like what the heck is that allowance in the first place i've never seen that in any other sport can you is there any comparison you can think no because like with baseball you can find like everything about guys contracts incentives i mean also there's no cap in baseball that's the thing no cap on gone the point here is more like this injury allowance and that the league requires an estimate from teams as to how much they expect to spend for the year. And I guess they have to stay in a certain window because of that. The the TPP, the total player payments figure, what makes it all the more perplexing is that the salary floor is 95% of the cap. So there really isn't that much room for flexibility to begin with. Yeah, so this could like really handicap some teams, I guess. You think about teams that just have horror injury runs like Carlton for their backs last year. And that could have, no pun intended, really hamstrung him even more. You know, if there are teams that are really going for it this year, for example, if the Lions or if Collingwood, with how much older the skilled side of their list has gone, if they have all these injuries, it's going to tie up their finances more. It just all confuses me. And then there's stuff about portions of the cap rolling over. There's just so little reporting on this compared to what we're used to. And I find that weird and just frustrating. I think if someone really fucks up their finances through this, we will know. I mean, we we know when teams fuck things up because it forces their hand. I bet you're thinking it would be the Gold Coast Suns that fuck this up more than anyone. Doesn't have to necessarily be. I mean, we know about their track record with finances. But yeah, like on the individual player level, we know that 12 players made a million. We don't know like specifics of really any contracts, though. 
We know like brackets of what players make and how many of them do. And this is from the league website. There's just no information. Like, what good does that do to keep things under wraps? Is the logic that they're protecting the clubs with this? I don't think so. I'm just wondering if any of this could be the, like a weird thing with loopholes like NHL long-term injury reserve. This seems to be like the opposite of that. But yeah, I mean, I don't really see any. Uh, this is like going outside the cap and it's already worked in. It's not, you know, teams try to circumvent the cap when they're already overpaying a lot of players like what happened with the NHL. You know, the Arizona Coyotes in particular were a team that took on all these old players' contracts knowing they wouldn't play and just said, yeah, we'll pay you, we'll put you on long-term injured reserve or whatever so that we reach the salary floor. Don't be the Arizona Coyotes in, like, any way. Yeah, they're, current play they're currently playing out of a 5,000-seat college arena. I don't think it's even 5,000 seats. It's The whole thing's a fucking joke. It's like... For those of you that know the NFL, think of the Chargers situation, but think of it lasting for way longer, you know, where they played in like a tiny stadium. Like that that was for a couple years. We don't know the timeline for the Coyotes, but the league is backing them in. Move them to Milwaukee and get it done. If not Milwaukee, Houston. There's a willing owner there in Tillman Fertitta. The Houston Arrows were a great hockey identity. Bring it back. Bring back the Arrows. And they're already in the right division for both those locations. And we're, like, much more serious about this than, you know, move north or another team to Tasmania. I mean, Tasmania deserves an expansion team in and of itself. And the NHL is kind of at a limit already with 32 teams. That's part of the difference. And this comparison between U.S. sports and the AFL continues because the last big point with salaries and contracts and other things is that Patrick Dangerfield, and he's important to name in this because he is the Players Association president, was so taken by the NBA trade deadline, it seems that he was talking about, you know, kind of floated the idea of a midseason trade period, kind of gauging people's desire for it. And I think there's one big issue that holds it up. You can probably see where it is as well, Ethan. Yeah, with how much leverage the players have, that just wouldn't work. Because players could kind of just say, send me here and kind of, you know, build a mid-season super team or denied trades and it's just with the current structure of the AFL it would not work yeah I mean the thing that makes trades in North American sports work is that the teams have the power they can trade players largely without their consent yes there are players you know in the upper tiers regarding skill and money who have you know, clauses in their contracts where there are certain teams to whom they don't want to be traded or sometimes full-on no trade or no move clauses. But by and large, the team can move someone as they see fit. Whereas in Australia, it's like everybody's Danny Heatley. They just kind of get to pick and choose where they go. Yeah, so Danny Heatley was a very good forward for a time who vetoed a trade away from the Ottawa Senators to, I believe it was Edmonton, and ended, yeah, I believe the, the Edmonton Oilers, and actually ended up with the San Jose Sharks, where he was incredibly entertaining. And then the Sharks were smart to trade him away before he overstayed his welcome. Yeah, I mean, this is also a guy who crashed a Ferrari and killed a teammate when he was playing in Atlanta. Yes, Atlanta had an NHL team, two of them, in fact. Not at the same time. No, the league isn't that stupid. They're close, though. Point is, Heatley had the no-trade clause. He was able to decide where he went. That's not normal. You know, like, I don't think Cam Johnson was begging to be traded to the Brooklyn Nets from Phoenix. Also, in the NBA in particular, you could trade draft picks way in advance, too, like four or five years out. Might be more than that. I might have seen something with seven before, maybe like the big Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce deal back in the day. But yes, seven years in advance. That is the maximum. Yeah. Whereas the AFL, it's two years. You know, you can trade up to the 2024 draft right now. For a more flexible trade period to work in the AFL, it would involve players giving up a lot of their leverage. And I don't see that happening. 
And if they don't give it up and they try to stay it anyway, it's just going to increase disparity in the league. There's going to be a more permanent gap between the top teams and the lower teams. Like, you're going to see something on par with what you sometimes see in European soccer, where you have, you know, the big clubs that are always contending, and then you have the middle to lower tier, you know, the teams that are always there in the Premier League, but are never considered title contenders. I don't think you would get that out of hand. You also don't have, you know, the whole promotion and relegation aspect to deal with. Correct, but to a smaller scale, you know, it's going to keep teams in in their tier for longer. And if you're wanting teams to really be able to develop and keep younger faces coming in, then you'd have to go like kind of full U.S. and the players would have to give up their bargaining rights. That's going to be the holdup to all of this, I see. It's a very strange system to us that the players have as much power as they do, but I don't see it changing despite Dangerfield's interest in it. I mean, he benefited from it before. I think it was more just kind of a fun what if than anything. I think so, but it's good fodder for conversation. A couple of pieces of trivia on a day that recently passed as we are about to wrap things up here. February 15th was an important day in footy for two reasons. Firstly, it was Neil Danaher's 62nd birthday. And, you know, through the big freeze and learning about his battle with MND or ALS, as we call it. It's just been really cool getting to know about Neil Danaher, his playing career, and just how positive his outlook on life is despite everything he's going through. Like, you always see him smiling, and I think that's pretty incredible. Our lives have been touched by ALS. We lost a family friend to it, and the positivity he has with it is, you know, something that's pretty rare and something that we should really cherish. The one other thing... February 15th also marked 10,000 days since Carlton won the flag. And honestly, I think Neil would be laughing about that right now. Carlton are, they continue with the hockey comparisons, Carlton are the Toronto Maple Leafs of the AFL. They might not have the longest championship drought like the Leafs do in the NHL, but the status is there, the colors are there, the upper class part of it is there, and they always find a way to be fucked by their own circumstances. And the rest of the league just gets this perverse entertainment out of it. One last thing before we go, and this is something that Ethan thought up, and we want to pose this to everybody who's listening as just a good question, a good thought experiment. Do you want to take this away, Ethan? Yeah, so your club will never beat one other club again, ever. In fact, you will lose to them every time. You will not ever draw them. You will lose. Home and away, finals, scratch match, we don't care. You will lose to them forever. Sometimes you'll get blown out. Sometimes you'll, you know, take them down to the wire. Either way, you're going to lose every time forever. However, you get to choose which club it is that you will always lose to. So I picked Melbourne for this because they're generally likable. They have a really funny song to the point where you can't be that upset after they beat you. None of their players were that obnoxious. They don't have enough fans to be obnoxious. I mean, they've got a membership base that I think is a little smaller than Geelong right now. It's just, it's hard to get that upset about them. They're likable and I wish them well, and I think they're silly in a very good way. Kazi Pickett is awesome. We kind of have to say that when we talk about Melbourne. Ooh, that's true. He, he is pretty cool. Who does Mason Cox like more, Kazi Pickett or Delta Goodrum? Ooh, that's tough. Probably cause even it's close. Yeah. I don't know. Gotta also consider how much he likes Britney Spears. Yeah. Leave her alone, though. The point is, like, especially with what we learned growing up, like, you sang you're a grand old flag in, what was it, first grade, most yeah. days? First grade. So I think that's where a lot of the humor comes from for you. I'm surprised you didn't pick an interstate team, though. And I thought about it, but no. Was there any other team that was really in the running for you? I kind of lightly considered the Lions, I guess, but nah, I like beating them. As an Eagles fan, I actually went with Geelong because I've gotten used to it these past few years. You know, there actually isn't a super long history of the Cats beating the Eagles. It's been five out of the last six meetings. But what's even more important than the short-term history is the stuff that's already happened in longer term. West Coast will always have a leg up on Geelong because the Eagles beat the Cats in the 92 and 94 Grand Finals before you were born. Yes, but it stands. 
And so unless somehow they match up in another two grand finals, they're always going to be able to be holding that over Cats fans regardless. So whatever else comes their way, they manage that. And it's, you know, a pretty neat thing to be able to say that, you know, it's not a huge number of premierships and multiple of them were over the same team. So, and that team will obviously be interstate helped as well. It was interesting. I posed this question on r slash AFL and got a pretty cool variety of answers out of it. A lot of people said Gold Coast just because maybe they're the team that people least expect to fuck up their season royally or even, you know, make it to a big enough stage for that to happen. See, on one hand, I get that. But on the other hand, it's like if you lose to the Suns, it could be the kind of loss that really fucks up your season, even if you don't face them in a final. But or as user Plenty Area 408 put it, they don't have any fans, but any win the Suns manage is such an event that the fans from the other 16 clubs will more than make up for it. Also, if everybody picks it, the Suns win every game. Um, Aussie Nick 1999, a Carlton supporter, said Gold Coast because we always fucking lose to them anyway. I mean, last year's was under some tried circumstances for them. Pitnet being hurt, Patrick Cripps getting hurt as well. Um... One Geelong supporter, Unable Bank 3884, also said Gold Coast, going off the rationale. Until they prove otherwise, they are the least likely to end Geelong's season. Exactly. The first answer that pops up when I'm looking at the page right now is from Giants fan Invisible Sandwich. Great name. Who wanted to say it just because it was fun to say and you took it from me. Invisible well, Sandwich. There, I said. Yeah. So they said... Fremantle, I feel a certain kinship with this fellow struggling interstate team that's never won a premiership with a large rival in the same city that dominates membership numbers. I also kind of considered GWS, but then I thought, eh, that home loss to them a couple of years ago was pretty annoying. Yeah. And but have some annoying players, Braden Proust. So yeah, that kind of ruled that one out. But the GWS and Fremantle logic is really sound here. I mean, the Swans have the biggest overall fan base because they have all of the biggest city in Australia and basically the entire state. And Fremantle is, you know, still very much the little brother of West Coast. And so there's definitely a kinship there. There was a Fremantle fan. I need to scroll down to see. No, it was, it was an Essendon fan, non-Newtonian snake who said, Frio because so many Essendon players end up going there at the end of their careers. There are a couple with connections like that. Obviously, there were some people who said Fitzroy University for obvious reason. I mean, that kind of a cop out that I was going to say, yeah. West Coast fan Godly84 said it would have to be the Saints. You obviously want to pick a team you're least likely to meet in the grand final. And Collingwood user Dosha Judgment said St. Kilda, sorry about 2010. Do you really feel sorry about winning a flag, though, especially when it's your most recent? I wouldn't. You know, you win. Do you have to feel sorry about it? No. Never. So again, we want to pose this question to all of you, and you can respond to it. We'll post it as a question on this episode on Spotify because we have that function available where we can ask a question to you on there. And we'll also post it on Twitter at Americans Footy, and we'll put it on YouTube as like a community thing. Yeah, a community thing. We'll have it as a pinned comment in the video. It will be everywhere. So. There will be plenty of platforms on which you can answer this question, but we want to get more feedback on this because this is a really good thought experiment. You know, everybody has their team, really. Some people have a second team, but this is more complex than just having a second team. Yeah, because when I think about, like, in other sports where I kind of have a second team, which team could I tolerate losing to every time? It would probably not be... That second team, it's a little harder for them to be your second team if they own your first team. Whereas, like, for example, with baseball, if I had to pick which team could the A's never beat again, it probably wouldn't be the Dodgers. It would probably be, like, the Brewers. Just, like, a team that's largely inconsequential to them. Yeah, and just, they're likable. They're not right in your backyard. They may have just ruined their relationship with their ace pitcher over $749,000. Yeah, that was fucking stupid. Or like, anyway, you get the point where it's... It's more complex than just which, yeah, it's it's not who's your second favorite team. 
That is not what is being asked here. And that's what makes this an interesting question. Yeah, so answer that wherever you want. We'll, you know, read out more answers from this. We'll definitely continue this thread with our next episode. Again, you can find us on Twitter and on YouTube at Americans Footy. I'm on Twitter at Castle Media. I am at BenjaminHK01. Brian Harambe, the footy cat, is running around the house at breakneck speed, probably playing with that favorite mouse toy of his. And he is on Instagram at cat named Brian. The season is fast approaching, and we're going to have some scratch matches to be looking at soon, some actual inter-club games. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to, you know, actually the show really getting on the road. And I know you all are as well. We're going to have to figure out what the fuck we're doing for a season preview. So if you have any suggestions, let us know. Yeah, bring it on. You and us. Thanks again for listening.